Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day, Lord, a beautiful day that uh, you've provided for us. And we just ask tonight, Lord, that as we sit at your feet and learn from you, that you would teach us those things we need to learn. Father, that we'd help apply these things to our lives so we can grow in our walk with you. We love you so much, and we want to worship you tonight, and we want to prepare our hearts to receive what you have for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, if you would please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22 as we continue our study of the, through the Word of God. And there's just a, a flurry of activity in our chapter this evening that we'll be looking at. You know, Jesus portraying Jesus, uh, preparation for the Passover, the Lord's Supper, communion, um, just a ton of stuff that we're going to be going through. So I'm not going to go over it now and then go over it again. But here's the thing. The chapter ends with Jesus appearing before the Sanhedrin. You think, oh man, how did that all happen? Please understand this. Before the foundations of the world were ever established, we see the love of God. Because he knew what he was going to have to do for sinful man, his creation, the ones he created. Before he even created us, he knew what we would do and he knew what he had to do to redeem man. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? To save us from our sin, exactly. And that's what we'll see here and on into Luke chapter 23, God's tremendous love for sinful man. And then in chapter 24 of Luke, we'll see Jesus rise from the grave. And, you know, since he rose, one day we will rise as well. And let's just jump in, Luke 22, starting in verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. Then he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. So the Feast of Passover is drawing near. It took place on the 14th of Nisan, and it speaks of our redemption. It was a feast that looked forward to the Lamb of God who'd come to take away the sins of the world. And as well as being a memorial feast, commemorating the angel of the Lord passing over the homes of those that had the blood placed on their doorpost when the children of Israel were down in Egypt. Those that did place the blood on the doorpost saw death of their firstborn. Well, immediately following the feast of Passover, beginning on the 15th of Nisan, was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which ran through the 21st of Nisan. And it speaks of our sanctification. That's what that feast is about. And these feasts kind of ran together. Sometimes both of them were spoken of as either the Feast of Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it was including both of them because Passover came, and right after Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now here's the thing. The feast is coming, and we're told that the Jewish religious leaders want to kill Jesus. Isn't it amazing? These guys had no fear in killing the Son of God. What did they fear? They feared the people. Wow. They didn't want to lose their positions. Wow. But they wanted to wait to Passover to take care of Jesus. I find that interesting. People still do that today. You know, they fear the people. So we're not going to talk about this. So we're not going to talk about that. Because I don't want to, f I'm fearing the people. They may get upset with me. I'll tell you what, you know, they will get upset, but if you teach the Word of God, that's just the way it is. People get offended by it because it convicts our heart. It hurts. God exposes stuff in our hearts that we need to get rid of, and we don't always like it. But I'll tell you what, you listen, you obey what the Lord is showing you, and it's the best thing for your life. And, you know, people kill Jesus in that they keep him out of their lives today. Think about that. They're still doing it by keeping him out. They're really destroying their own lives. Now, what's interesting is here in verse 3, it says, Then Satan entered Judas. Now, we're told that this took place during the Passover meal in John 13, 27. It says, Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. It's possible, I'm not saying this is how it plays out, that Luke isn't giving us a chronological order of events, but just stating a fact that Satan himself entered Judas. It's also possible that Satan could have entered Judas more than once. We don't know that. It, it, that's also possible. I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. It seems like two different instances here in Luke and in John. 
But again, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it, but I do. we do know that Satan entered Judas, and in John, we're also told that it was night, and it was night for Judas. The light had gone out for him. So J Satan enters Judas and brings him before these Jewish religious leaders, and they're talking about how to betray him to put Jesus to death. They want an opportune time to arrest him. Now when the crowds of people, and again, this is Passover, so Jerusalem is filled with people. So not when all these people are around him. We want a time when he's all alone, when there's not these crowds by him. And here's the thing. No one forced Judas to do this. He was responsible for his actions. Remember Flip Wilson and what he used to say? The devil made me, or, yeah, the devil made me do it. Well, no. The devil can influence our lives. Satan's demons can influence our lives. But we have a choice, just like we have a choice with Jesus, right? Absolutely. Well, look at verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So they went and found it as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, as they're preparing for this meal, the Passover meal, Jesus tells Peter and John to look for this guy carrying a pitcher. That wasn't the normal thing. Usually the women carried liquids in pitchers. Men carried liquids in animal skins. So it was a sign. When you saw a man carrying a pitcher, like, hey, this is the guy we need to talk to. It's probable that Jesus had made arrangements with this guy ahead of time of, to prepare this room. This is where the Passover meal was going to be gathered. And many feel that this was John Mark's father's house. John Mark was probably 12 years old or so at this time. And that means that his father, John Mark's father, was the one carrying this pitcher. In Acts 12.12, 12, we're told, So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So in Acts, we're told that the early church gathered at his house. And again, like I said, many feel this is probably where he had the Passover meal um, with his disciples. Why the secrecy? Why is it, you know, go there, find this guy, find a place? Why didn't he tell a lot of people? Because I don't think he wanted Judas to know because it wasn't the right time yet. I think he obviously told Judas when they went, but not ahead of time. Now, here's the thing. And this is something that had troubled me for many, many years. Jesus and his men will celebrate the Passover meal probably on Wednesday, I believe. And he was also crucified on Passover. How does that work? Some people try to say, well, it wasn't really Passover, the Passover meal that Jesus was celebrating. Well, then what was it if it wasn't the Passover meal? I mean, it sure looks like the Passover here. That's what it says it was. So how could they have a Passover meal and then the next day, Jesus is crucified on Passover. How does that work? I, I like what one writer said. This is kind of interesting because it gives you some insight. Logically, it makes no sense, but God has a way of working things out that's incredible. Josephus, the great Jewish historian who was a Pharisee living in Jesus' day, explained the law of the Passover. And he said the Paschal lamb was to be eaten during the night and nothing left for morning. The Mishnah says it must be eaten by midnight. So they both were committed to the fact that whoever ate it, you had to eat it before the dawn of another day, before the morning time. Now, listen very carefully, he says. As you dig into this history a little bit, and this is what I found fascinating, the Galileans, that's the northern people, and the Pharisees counted the day from sunrise to sunrise, the day of Passover, whereas the Judean and Sadducees counted it from sunset to sunset. You say, how do you know that? Well, the Mishnah, which is the codification of Jewish law, tells us that. It says, for example, that the Galileans would not work at all on the day of Passover. Why? Because the day began for them at the beginning, at sunrise. 
says that the Judeans would work until the midday because the day didn't begin for them until the sun set. And you say, what does this all mean? He says, listen very carefully. First thing it does is it harmonizes John 18 and 19 because it tells us that the Galileans, which would be Jesus and his disciples and the Pharisees, could have had their Passover on the evening because they already began to count the day from morning to morning, and it would end on the next morning. And the others, who were from Judea and who were Sadducees, which made up the rulers, wouldn't start their day festivities until late in the evening and wouldn't kill their lamb until the end of the next day. Why is that important? It's odd that it would be like that. It's very odd. And we really can't identify specifically as how that came to pass. But what fascinates me is this. Jesus had to die on, crucified, when the traditional Judean Jerusalem Passover lambs would be killed from 3 to 5 in the evening. He had to die then. That's why it says in the ninth hour. He also had to keep the Passover because he had to transform it into the Lord's table. So how could Jesus keep the Passover and still be the Passover lamb? There would be absolutely no way that could be possible unless God allowed this kind of thing to take place in history. So then when it came to that very moment that Jesus was going to die in that very year, there was no problem in having a Galilean Passover and dying in the Judean Passover, perfectly scheduled, scheduled and violating no Jewish law at all. He celebrated Passover with his men and he was the Passover lamb. That's how it all works together. That for years, I was scratching my head. How can that? It, it just doesn't fit. And you're trying to fit the days together. And when you read the story, it, does, it doesn't fit. But it does if you understand their history and the things that they were doing. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Absolutely. And this is what we're heading towards now, the cross to Calvary. Look at verse 14. And when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Again, this was the last Passover meal Jesus would celebrate with his men. And it's the last one that was needed because the Lamb of God has come to take away the sins of the world. And keep in mind there is another feast that's coming. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb that we will all celebrate together. What a great time that will be. Now, this is not the beginning of the end for Jesus. And really not for us. This is the beginning of beginnings. I mean, we're starting anew. We start afresh in Christ. I love that. Now, before he goes, he gives his men communion, or the new covenant that's found in his shed blood. Look at verse 19. He took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Keep in mind that everything within that Passover meal had symbolic meaning. The bitter herbs recalled the bitterness of slavery. The salt water remembered the tears shed under Egypt's oppression. The main course, the lamb, uh, did not symbolize anything connected to the agonies of Egypt. It was really the sin-bearing sacrifice that allowed the judgment of God to pass over the house that believed. And that's what we see. Now, Here's the thing when it comes to communion. There is a potpourri of ideas what this is all about. You know, the Roman Catholic Church holds to the idea of transubstantiation, which teaches that the bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Jesus. You know, Jesus, let me make this really clear, because this is really simple and people make it too complicated. Jesus would not institute something that is contrary to the scriptures, and the drinking of blood is contrary to the scriptures. That He would not do that. It, it makes no sense. Martin Luther held the idea of consubstantiation. It teaches the bread remains bread, the wine remains wine, but by faith they are the same as Jesus' actual body. 
I, I'm, I don't even get that one totally. I'm not sure. But you don't see that here. Not at all. Um, it, it's almost like the Roman Catholic. And he did come out of the Roman Catholic Church, but he went, he, I, I think he still missed the point. The elements of communion do not become the actual body and blood of Christ. They symbolically represent his body, the bread which was broken for us, his blood, the wine which was shed for our sins. And he said, do this in remembrance of me, of, me, of him. I think it's clear. It's, it's a picture of the new life we have in Christ. And it's based upon the finished work of, of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And you know, I, I realize some will go to the Gospel of John and you know say, unless you eat this bread and drink this blood, you will, you know, no means you will perish. But read on. See, we tend to when we're reading Scripture, we tend to stop at a verse and come up with a doctrine. But read on. What is after it? What's before it? What's the whole chapter or whole section saying? Because if you go into John, you will see that Jesus says the flesh profits nothing. Well, if we're eating his actual flesh and drinking his actual blood, if this is nothing, why are we doing it? Because it's all about the spirit. It's not about the actual blood and, his, and actual flesh that we are partaking. Do it in remembrance of me. Remember what I have done for you. Don't forget it. Let's see, we, we, it's so easy to go to these unbiblical um, conclusions, and I think it's dangerous. There is no way you'd come up in the scriptures and say this is the actual body and blood of Christ. Verse 21, But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined but woe to that man who he has betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. Now, as you read that, it looks like Jesus, or Judas, excuse me, partook of the Lord's Supper, and yet in the other Gospels, there's no way it didn't happen. I think Luke, again, is giving us not the chronological order. I think, you know, he, he gives us... Um, just an overview, and he, things are not necessarily in, in order. One writer put it like this. He said, in Luke's Gospel, several incidences are recounted according to subject matter rather than being presented in the order in which they actually occurred. This is clear in the narrative of the baptism of Christ. Luke mentions the story of John the Baptist, his sermons, his preaching for repentance by baptism, and his baptizing of the multitude in the Jordan River. He then mentions that King Herod arrested John the Baptist and shut him up in prison because John had rebuked him for his marriage to Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. It is well known, as mentioned in the Gospels, that Christ was baptized by John in the Jordan before he was shut up in prison and before John's martyrdom, which followed his imprisonment. However, Luke, after mentioning the imprisonment of John, continues saying, When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized, and while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily uh, form like a dove upon him. So I don't think Luke has given us necessarily the chronological order, but these are some of the things that took place um, at the Passover meal. And again, Judas, before Passover began, he left. He was not there. He did not celebrate Passover. Or, excuse me, communion. Verse 24. But there was also rivalry among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I among you as the one who serves. You know, let's face it, we are so much like these guys. So much. Here it is, fat, the Feast of Passover. They're arguing still, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? I want to be. And they're fighting. They're competing against each other. It's not theirs to take. It never was. God takes care of those things. And 
they were focused on self instead of the Lord and what the Lord was trying to show them, teach them, say to them. At least three times it's recorded that Jesus spoke of his death and resurrection to them. And here in Luke, he's speaking of his suffering. And they're arguing, you know, I'm the greatest, just like Muhammad Ali, right? They were earlier than him, so. Who's with these guys? Jesus. Who's the greatest? Oh, yeah. Never elevate yourself above Jesus, guys. We're servants. You see? In fact, in John chapter 13, recording these events, Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. That was the job of the lowliest servant. I mean, when you were lowest on the totem pole as a slave, as a servant, that's the job you got. You washed the feet of people who came in. I understand they didn't have sneakers in those days. You know, they had sandals. Their feet were dirty. And you had to wash them. And Jesus got down and washed their feet. It's amazing when you look at the creator of heaven and earth and how he humbled himself and came to serve, not to be served. And he asks us to do the same. You know, as you look at the world, you see that people want to lord over others, don't you? I mean, it's, I mean, it's so obvious. Everyone wants to control, be on top, be the big dog. No one likes to serve. And as Christians, that should not be our attitude. I don't care who you are within the body of Christ. We're all servants, different roles. My position is not more important than someone else's position. It's called the body of Christ. And God has given us different gifts to use for his glory. It's not because I'm so great I have this position. There are plenty of other people who could do what I'm doing. He chose me. I don't know. I can't. I'm not going to argue. But I'm grateful that I get to serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords at any capacity. And how often just people want to be served. But Jesus came to serve. Wow. It kind of puts things in perspective. You know, we if we're servants, why are we sitting down? to be working. Jesus said, occupy until I come. Continue working. Don't sit around doing nothing. Some people, you know, they have health issues. They, there's different things. You pray, right? That's not sitting around doing nothing. You don't realize how important prayer is. Pray for the leadership here. Pray for the people here. Pray for this community. Pray for this nation. Pray for this world. There's so much, right? I mean, you could spend your life praying. Every day. It's amazing when you, I mean, you watch the news and you can pray. That's it, man. There's my prayer list right there. In fact, you know, Jesus says, yet I am among you as the one who serves. Can you imagine? I don't know how these guys felt after that. You know, they're arguing, right? Who's the greatest? And Jesus basically rebukes them, you know, and says, look, I'm here to serve. And then he washes their feet. Wow. A servant leader. And that's truly what we are. Servant leaders, guys. Verse 28. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials. With me in, uh, with me in my trials. And I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my father bestowed one upon me. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So Jesus is speaking to his men here, the apostles, and he's saying, look, you're going to receive a unique reward because you are the ones who have continued with him, with Jesus, in his trials. And they're going to be rewarded. They're going to sit on, the 12, uh, sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Their names are going to be on the 12 foundations of the wall of the New Jerusalem. But you know what? Here's the thing. We don't serve the Lord to get something. We serve the Lord to bring glory to him. And that's the key. Does God bless us? Absolutely he does. He blesses us more than we could ever think. And again, being able to serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is pretty amazing. You know, 
I don't know about you, but I look at my life and I go, wow, you know, I really did not expect God to use me like he has. And I'm sure every one of you can say, it's, it's incredible. I know where I was at before I got saved. I know the things that I was doing. And I wasn't necessarily a bad guy in the world's eyes. But what was, my, what was, I, what was I leaving behind? What treasure am I giving to people? And here's the thing. The treasure I want to leave behind now is far different than before. Because the treasure I want to leave behind now is Jesus. I want everyone to know that he is my Lord and my Savior. And when I go, when this body goes back to the dust of the earth, I want people to know that I'm not dead. I just moved. It's moving day. The tent fell apart. We buried it. But my soul and spirit's with the Lord. And what that's what I want people to see. That's you know, it's not about me. It's about him. And I just want to be open to whatever the Lord wants to do in my life, however he wants to use me. And I think you do too. Lord, you know, help me to keep my eyes open, my ears attentive to the people I see, the words they say, and then give me the words to say to them. And he will. Verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you may know me. Keep in mind that in Matthew 26, 31, Jesus said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. And Peter probably reacted more. You know, He rejected that. Um, and they all basically agreed, hey, we're not going to deny you. But I think Peter was more sure of himself, more vocal than the others. And the Lord singles Peter out here. And what the Lord is doing is, Peter, I'm going to show you what's in your heart. Now that may sound good, but it's not. It's good for us, but it's not good for us, okay? Because we really see what's inside of us. Peter, I, I think Peter was so sincere. I have no doubt. Peter was sincere. Lord, I will die for you, man. I'll, whatever happens, I am for you. Haven't we done that before? Lord, I'm with you, man, on this. And then all of a sudden, and God is showing us, you know, what's in our heart. And the thing that I love is, you know, Jesus says, you know, Satan's going to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. God prays for us. He intercedes for us. Yeah. Satan wanted to crush Peter. And Jesus prayed for him. Now, if I was able to just sit down with Jesus, he was there in the chair. And if I was Peter, I'm like, you know, make that prayer that I don't have to go through this. Don't let Satan sift me like wheat. That, that doesn't sound good. Let, let's just, just pray that it doesn't happen. He doesn't do that, does he? Why? Because Peter needed to know what was in him. A lot of self-confidence, self-assurance, a lot of him that needed to die so more of Jesus could live in him. And that's important. It's a problem we struggle with, self. And, you know, self-confidence is built on shaky ground. Isn't it amazing how it could crumble just like that? And what, one writer said it's, it's sometimes easier to bear a great load for, Christian, or for Christ than a small one. Some of us could be martyrs at the stake more easily than confessors among sneering neighbors. <laughs> yeah, ain't that the truth? You know, but Paul, 2 Corinthians 12.10 said, Therefore I take pleasure in affirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Weak in the flesh. You know, Paul, Paul wasn't saying, you know, bring it on. Bring you know, the per persecutions, the infirmities, the reproaches. Bring all this stuff on me. No, he wasn't saying it. But what he's saying is, all these things have come upon my life. And you know what? 
they saw my, I was able to see my strength, that I can't do this. But I'm strong in him. You see, it has a way of destroying self and getting us focused on the Lord to trust in him because we can't do it. Yeah, that's an important lesson we need to learn. Peter needed to learn it. We need to learn it. Verse 35. And he said to them, When I sent you without money bags, sack and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said nothing. And then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise a sack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. Then they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it's enough. Now, things are changing here. When the disciples went out before, they didn't need these things because they were going to receive with goodwill, hospitality. But things are changing. Now it's a hostile world out there. And they must use common sense as they go. It's going to be tough. And it's amazing the number of Christians that don't use common sense. They're totally unprepared for the spiritual battle we're in. And this spiritual battle is manifested in the physical realm. And in verse 37, Jesus makes it clear. He says, you know, all that's written of him in the scriptures are going to be fulfilled, related to his, this first coming, his, all the way through his crucifixion, his, him rising from the dead, will be completed. He finished the work that he was sent to do. Now, I don't want to offend anyone, but it is what it is. When Jesus said, he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one, has been misused and it's been abused. And as many read verse 38, it gets worse. Luke says, so they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it's enough. I remember it was some, probably some 30 years ago or so, I was listening to a Christian radio station in Chicago, and they were discussing this verse. And they were using it for Christians to bear arms and to fight back. And you know me, I can't just let things go. And I, I called them, I said, that's, ex that's not at all what Jesus is saying here. And we'll talk a little bit about it in a second, but not at all. But they, they weren't very interested in that. It was more of a militant form of Christianity. We're going to fight. We're going to take back this. We're going to, I don't know, man. Show me in the New Testament where Paul, you know, got his M16 out and started shooting people. Oh, they didn't have M16s. Fine. They had swords. They had weapons. They had arrows. They had whatever, you know. Do you see it at all? No. Do you protect your family? Absolutely, you protect your family. Absolutely. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying there are times that we're going to be persecuted. It's going to get tough out there. And you can't use this verse to justify that. When it says it is enough, what Jesus is saying is don't say anything more about this. It's not saying, well, you know, two is enough. Well, all right. Let's think rationally about this, okay? You guys are 11 guys now with Jesus, okay? 11 plus Jesus. You got two swords. There's 600 guys coming, probably a total of 1,000, 600 soldiers coming. You got two swords. What are you going to do? Chop off an ear? Oh, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Yeah, I'm getting ahead of the story. Two swords? How are you going to defend yourself? That's ridiculous. It makes no sense. Here's the thing. Are we fighting a physical battle? Think about that one. Many would say, yes, it's the liberals, it's the Democrats, it's this person, it's that person. Are we fighting a physical battle? Absolutely not, it's a spiritual battle. We fight this on our knees. We use the spiritual armor that God has given us. Paul in 2 Corinthians 10 said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Very interesting, huh? Yeah, we, we live in the flesh. Absolutely we do. Here we are, flesh and blood. But we're not warring against the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 
but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Our battles, our spiritual battles are fought with spiritual weapons, not with physical weapons. You won't destroy them. The only way you're going to win is using the spiritual weapons that God has given us and prayerfully hoping that they come to saving faith. Their lives are changed. Well, verse 39 said, And coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he, he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, remember, Judas was looking for an opportune time to get Jesus alone. And he, I, he let the Jewish religious leaders know he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane very often at night to pray. That would be a perfect place. This is something he often did. Interesting enough, this place on the Mount of Olives called Gethsemane means olive press. And yeah, Jesus was going to be crushed for our sins, but in this garden, we also see the forces of darkness trying to crush him, for him to fail his mission. Isn't that interesting? They're trying to destroy the mission that Jesus was on. Yeah, to me, this is one of the greatest spiritual battles ever fought. And how was it won? Jesus was praying. Go figure. He was praying. How important that is for us. And all of his men went up on the Mount of Olives, but only Peter, James, and John went into this garden area where he prayed, just a short distance away from him that they were. And he has his close friends with him at this time of great anguish. I, I like that, you know. Isn't that an important thing for us? That when we're going through a very difficult time, very trying time, they have brothers and sisters around us that can encourage us and help us. Absolutely. Hopefully they're a little better than these guys. They were sleeping a lot, but you know what I mean. We should be there for others. And, you know, Jesus prays three times, goes back, and he finds these guys sleeping each time. And, yeah, the Spirit's willing. The flesh is very, very weak. And I understand this whole idea about, you know, being good or good works getting us into heaven. But all you have to do is go and read the story in the Garden of Gethsemane and you see that it's impossible. That's not at all going to work. Why? Because Jesus prayed this to the Father. Father, if it is your will, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He's asking, Father, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, let this cup of judgment, your judgment, be removed from me. I, if I don't have to go to Calvary, let's, let's go a different way. So if there are other ways to heaven, and either the father ignored the prayer of the son, or he lied to his son saying, there is no, there is, there's no other way when there really was. Well, obviously that's wrong. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the father except through me. Peter said in Acts 4.12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is none. And so this cup that he was about to drink was the cup of the wrath of God, which was to be poured upon him as he bore the sins of the world. You see, it's not my way, it's not your way, it's Yahweh. That's it. We, we make it so complicated. And what, what's amazing is a child can understand the salvation message. And it's so rich, it's so deep, we could spend years looking at it and never finish looking at it. And yet so many people make it so complicated that they can't even believe it. To me, it's very simple. I'm a sinner. I can't get to heaven because the gulf between me and God is too big. There's nothing I could do to attain that salvation. I need a mediator, I need a bridge builder to bridge that gap between me and God. 
Jesus is the mediator. He is the bridge builder. He is the one who brings me to the Father. He bore the sins of the world. It's simple. And yet, wow, what God has done for us. Amazing. Verse 43. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, and he had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. And then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. So Peter, James, and John are sleeping. They should have been there with Jesus, but they're sleeping, and God the Father sends an angel to strengthen Jesus during this difficult time. And he's in agony, so much so that he's sweating drops of blood. And there is a medical condition that can cause that. And that's what was going on with Jesus. This, there was an agony going on in the Garden of Gethsemane that night. It was a battle. And Jesus went into the garden in agony. And he left in peace. Wow. How did that happen? I mean, that's, those are pretty extreme. Because he said, not my will, but yours be done. He surrendered. And isn't that true in our lives? When we're fighting against God, God wants us to do something, and we're like, I'm, not gonna, I'm, I'm just not going to do it. I don't want to do it. And we're fighting with them. And we're, we're not at peace at all. We're in agony over it until we surrender. And sometimes the situation that we're in, it's difficult what God wants us to do. It's not easy what he wants us to do. And we're in agony because of the difficulty of the situation. Not because we don't want to do it, but because it's hard. But I'll tell you, you surrender. Lord, I'm going to do what you want. And you're at peace. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm going to trust you. And I've seen that, you know, several times, you know, in, in my Christian walk, where just agonizing over something, knowing what God wants me to do, and then just giving it to Him. Okay, Lord, I, I, not necessarily like this. I, I, this is, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but Lord, I know I'm going to trust you on this one. I'm going to do it, and I did it. And was it hard? It was absolutely hard. Did it turn out the way I wanted? No, it turned out the way God wanted, I'm sure. He's usually in control. He's always in control. And I think, why fight against God who knows everything? I know what's right before me. I don't even know what's going to happen a minute down the road, 30 seconds down the road, yet God knows my entire life from my birth so my death, he knows everything. So who do I want to trust? You know, so many people today, you know, I go to these astrologers and fortune tellers because they're going to tell me my future. He's already told me. Because I've asked, repented of my sins and asked him to be Lord of my Savior, you know what? I know my future. I'm going to be with him. I don't have to call these psychic hotlines. I don't have to have these tarot card readings. I know exactly what God has said. And I rest in that. I like it. Now, it's nighttime, right? And they didn't have street lights. And imagine 600 guys, maybe up to, probably up to 1,000 guys, but 600 soldiers, lanterns, coming from the temple area up the Mount of Olives. And as Jesus is there, talking to his men now, waking them up. Why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. Here come, he could see these guys approaching. It, it must have been pretty amazing. And, and Jesus is saying, you know, guys, be on guard. Pay attention. Look where you're walking. You know, remember as a kid, your parents say that? Pay attention to where you're walking, you know. And you walk into the wall or whatever because you're just goofing around. Don't trip and fall. And that, he's telling these guys because he's going to be gone shortly. Pay attention, guys. Look at verse 47. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, 
Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. <laughs> but Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. And then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Wow. So Jesus just finished you know, speaking to his men, and here's Judas with this cohort of men, some 600 armed men, plus chief priests, soldiers, um, the Sanhedrin, high priests. 800,000 men easily for one man in the middle of the night, and they're armed. And the plan of Judas was to go and kiss Jesus. That would identify him to the soldiers. This is the one. Now, isn't that interesting? They didn't really know who this Jesus was. We, we think everyone was aware of him. The, you know, the Roman soldiers didn't really care about him. He was a, a meaningless person to them. You know, they didn't have his you know, picture at the post office, you know, wanted. Judas had to pick him out. Well, they didn't, it was nighttime, it was dark. Yeah, well, they had like several hundred lanterns, so I'm sure pretty much lit up his face. It'd be easy if they knew who he was to pick him out. Judas gives him a kiss of love betraying him and identifying him to these soldiers to arrest him. And remember they had two swords, right? That darn Peter. He must have had one of them because he's the guy that grabbed the sword. And, and what I love about Peter, he doesn't go after the big strong soldiers, right? He goes to the servant of the high priest who obviously wasn't armed and he cuts off his ear which means the guy was probably running away. He saw Peter with the sword going, man, a fisherman and a sword, that's not a good thing. And he takes off, and Peter cuts off his ear. And what does Jesus do? He has to fix what Peter did. Can you imagine? I, you know, at, at that point, and I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I read that. Okay, Peter cuts off this guy's ear. Jesus picks it up, puts it back on. No one said, oh my gosh. Maybe this is the Messiah. I mean, come on. you got almost a thousand people up there. Not one of them thought, this guy's pretty good. This isn't, you know, this isn't a parlor trick here. I, I don't get that. But I guess our hearts could be so hard. We could be so, hey, this is what I'm doing. I'm coming to arrest them, and I don't care what anyone says or does. I'm going to arrest them. I, I don't know. Interesting. And again, you're not going to win these battles with physical swords, but with the sword of the Spirit. You know, when you give out the Word of God, it cuts to the heart like a surgical instrument. You know, that's why people get angry when the Word of God is being taught, because it's cutting them. You know, when, when Peter in Acts chapter 2 spoke on Pentecost, it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You see, we're not like Islam. Praise Allah or die. I kill you. That's not, that's not Christianity. Praise Jesus or die? Eh, no. What we do is we give forth the word of God, which is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces to the division of soul, spirit, and joint and marrow. It cuts to the heart of the matter. And the conviction will either draw them to Jesus or they'll be really angry like the Jewish religious leaders and stop their ears and make all kinds of noise and look like demonic beings. But don't stop giving out the word of God. And how much better is it to cut the hardness of the heart away than cutting off an ear? That's not going to win anything. How many more ears did he have to go? You know, if there was a thousand people, he had, you know, a lot of ears to cut off there, right? And still don't win. And, and this is a sad point, you know, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Ow, right? And, and here's the thing. These religious leaders, they were so into the law, but this whole trial, this arrest of Jesus was illegal. They weren't to do it at night. 
He's go he, there's going to be three chi religious trials, one before Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest, then before Caiaphas, and then before the Sanhedrin, or the Jewish religious body. Then the three uh, civil trials with Pilate and Herod, and then Pilate again before Jesus is crucified. But this was an illegal trial. It, the Jewish law prohibited any part of a legal, legal, legal proceeding in capital offenses to take place at night. When was Jesus arrested? Oh, at night. You see, they had no problem in breaking the law because they were doing it. And when someone else broke the law, oh, you healed on the Sabbath. You gave someone life on the Sabbath. You can't do that. Wait till another day. That's ridiculous. And here they're plotting to kill someone, and it was against the law itself. And there, you'll see on the web page, there's several things that they did that goes against the law that they said that they were holding on to so much. But look at verse 54. Let's see how this is all played out. Then, having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed at a distance. Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are them. But Peter said, Man, I'm not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me. Three times Then Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now, Here's the thing. They, Luke skips Jesus' encounter with Annas, goes right to the high priest, goes to Caiaphas' house, and remember that Jesus already told Simon. He said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. And what Jesus warned Peter about, guess what? It happened. Peter refused it. No, it's not going to happen. I know myself. No, God knows you better. He knows you much better. Now, here's the problem for Peter. We kind of see this played out, and we can apply it to our lives. He, First of all, we're told that he followed Jesus at a distance. That's a problem. He sat down at the enemy's fire just blending in with the crowds. And then when he was exposed that he might be one of those followers of Jesus, he goes into a dark area, the other gospel says. Okay, maybe if I hide here, no one will see me. And then it says about an hour passed, and I'm sure Peter thought, Psh, dodge that bullet, man, I'm good. And then he's called out again, and he denies the Lord, and the rooster crows. Man. And here's the thing. Luke tells us that the eyes of Jesus met the eyes of Peter, and he wept bitterly. How do you think he looked at Peter? Did you ever think about that? I mean, it doesn't tell us. How do you think Jesus looked at Peter? He's in Caiaphas' house. He's looking out the window. Rooster crows. He looks out, sees Peter. Peter sees him. Was it, I told you to do that, Peter? Loser? I don't think so. How could you do that, Peter? Well, why would he even ask that? He told Peter he was going to do that, right? How do you think Jesus looked at Peter? I think with the most amazing love in his eyes. Oh, Peter. And you know what? It broke him. He saw Jesus' love for him. Even in his failure, he blew it big time. In fact, the word look usually signifies a look of interest, love, or concern. I think just with all that love that flowed from Jesus as he sat in Caiaphas' house, looking at Peter at this point, it just, again, broke him. So no surprise to Jesus, and we know God's love for us. And here's the thing. 
if Peter would, you know, look at the whole thing that Jesus said, Jesus said in verse 32 of Luke 22, when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. How do you think Peter felt at this point? That's it. I'm done. I blew it. There's, I mean, what else can I do? I denied him. It's over for me. I'm not an apostle anymore or whatever, you know. But the Lord said, when you have returned to me, strengthen your brother. What's that about? Well, Peter, when you reach that point where you've come to the end of yourself and you return to me, I want you to take those lessons and share them with your brother and to encourage them because they're going to blow it too. How many of you in your Christian walk have blown it? You better all raise your hand. You've got a lot of pride in you. We all have. And don't you feel like a failure? Don't you feel, oh, that's it. And Satan has really good at, at messing with their minds at this point. You know, well, you call yourself a Christian, you know, and, and we're just beat ourselves up. Oh, man, that's it. I'm done. I, I, I've blown it. Does God give up on us? No. I will never leave you or forsake you. He who began a work and you will complete it. Praise God for that. <laughs> you know, how many people give up? They just, you know, in relationships. That's it. I can't do it anymore. God doesn't. And he should because of the way we are. But he doesn't because he loves us that much. And I'm so thankful. And it's just what a comfort that is. It should be to our lives. When you come to the end of yourself, when you remember me, strengthen the brethren. Okay, so that's to us, I believe, also. When you go through those times, as you come out of them and learn those lessons that God has shown you, help others. Don't be, I told you so. Loser. Restore. Because that's exactly, as we get into the Gospel of John, we see Jesus restore Peter. Because I think Peter was just broken. He needed to be restored. He needed to hear from Jesus that it's okay. Because I don't think he remembered when you returned to me. In fact, I love Jeremiah 31.3. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Is that our God? Absolutely. Ephesians 2.4 But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. It's because I'm such an adorable kid, you know? I'm just one of those great guys that God's got to love. No! That's not the reason. His great love is in spite of me. Wow. I am so glad that God doesn't get, you know, the DVD out of my life and play it for you all to see all the things that are in my heart or in my mind. He sees all of that. And he loves me. Wow. Incredible. Incredible love. Don't let the enemy sift you as wheat and blow you away with his lies. Let what God is doing in your life bring you to the place where you look up and repent and get right. Because God's in the business of restoration, not destruction. Well, verse 63. Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. Again, this is still before they gathered with the Sanhedrin. That's coming up in the morning light. They're still at the house of Caiaphas, and it's before sunrise at this point. And they're beating Jesus. They blindfold him. Why? Because you can't see the punches coming and you can't turn to lessen the blows. And that's something my dad taught me. My dad was a boxer and he said, you know, the guys that get hurt the most are the ones that don't see the punch coming and they can't turn to lessen the blows, but they get the full punch and they're out. And that's, Jesus was taking the full blow here. In fact, Isaiah 52, 14 tells us what took place hundreds of years before it actually happened. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage, Jesus, was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. 
He didn't even resemble a man anymore. He was so beaten by the end. All that he's going to do before these religious leaders and then before Pilate. Incredible. The scourging and the crucifixion. Well, look at verse 66. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? And he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. So this is now the official trial before the Sanhedrin. And there's no witnesses, which they were they needed. There were no witnesses because at night when they had the witnesses, they all contradicted themselves. There was no one that they could use. And these religious leaders wanted the truth. That's what they said. If you're the Christ, tell us. And Jesus said, you're not going to believe me even if I tell you. But he lets them know anyway. They weren't interested in the truth. They, if, if they were interested in the truth, they would already believe. Why? Because of all the miracles that Jesus did that authenticated his ministry. If he was the fulfillment of what the Old Testament prophets spoke regarding the Messiah. But they rejected it. And they rejected it so much they couldn't deny the miracles. So they said, you are doing these things by the power of Beelzebub, or the power of the devil. You're not doing this by the power of God. Wow, that's a hard heart. Think about you know people today. They don't want to know the Jesus of the Bible. They just want to know the Jesus that they've developed or, man, or thought of in their own minds. One that is just loves everyone and doesn't, no judgment, no sin, just do what you want. Well, it's not the Jesus of the Bible. And the idol you've made comes from the imagination of your own heart to justify your sin. And that's not going to save you. So, not a good thing. And what made these guys so angry? Because Jesus said not only that he's going to sit at the right hand of the power, he also told them, you guys got it right. I'm the Son of God. I like that. What Jesus is saying is, the Father and I are one. One God manifested actually in three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He made himself equal with the Father. That's why they got so upset. How many groups today just want to deny the deity of Jesus? I don't know what they do with this. At least the Jewish religious leaders were honest. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying, that he claimed to be God equal with the Father. And that's what made him so angry. And again, they didn't want to know the truth. Listen, and we talked about this before, but in Matthew 22, verses 41 through 46, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. And he said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. Jesus wants to draw out their faith. Hey guys, answer this question for me. If David calls his son Lord, how can he do that? Because it's not kosher. A father would never call his son Lord, but a son would call his father Lord. So, guys, think about this. How is he his son? Oh, he's more than a son. See, that's the thing that they, didn't, they refused to see. Because they knew if they would have answered that, they would have been in trouble. He's more than the son of David. He is the son of God. Wow. Paul in, in Romans 1, verses 3 and 4, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. They refused to answer that because they knew if they answered it correctly, they would have to admit that Jesus is God and they refused to do it. They were not interested in the truth. 
that's sad. And, you know, next time we're going to see them lead Jesus to Pilate, we will look at his crucifixion. But let me leave you with this from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 7 through 10. Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. That life is found in him. How many people, like these Jewish religious leaders, let tradition, let pride, the fear of man get in the way of them coming to Christ? I mean, that was the issue here. We don't want to lose our position with Rome. We don't want to admit we're wrong. You know what? I, I want to know the truth. I don't want someone to lie to me. I remember when my dad was, you know, he had colon cancer and it metastasized his liver and his, his brain, and it, it was nasty. And uh, when the doctors finally told my mom that, you know, there's nothing more we can do, we sat down with the family, and they didn't want to tell him that he was going to die. I'm like, you have to tell him. Don't lie to him. You're going to tell him he's getting better? He's not. He knows he's not getting better. you got to speak the truth. And so they refused to tell him, so I told him. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, to tell your dad, there's nothing else we could do for you, dad. That's it. But you know what? How more important it is regarding salvation. Do you want to make people feel good about going to hell? Oh yeah, you're a good person, don't worry. You know, I, I, I dislike when unbelievers die and their family members are there. You, know, you want to say, you know, he's in a better place, but you know he's not. You can't say that. Speak the truth. Will people always like it? No. That's just the reality, you know. People don't like the truth, you know. Like the Bears are better than the Packers. They don't like that, you know. Sorry. But you know what? There are those that will be convicted. There will be those who come to saving faith. And isn't that what it's about? You know, you look at the parable of the soils. Uh, only one fourth of those soils produced fruit. We want everyone saved when we talk with them. Lord, why aren't you saving all these people? It just doesn't work like that. There's the parable. It shows us that it's not, it doesn't happen on, you know, as much as we would like it. But it does. I mean, I, I was blessed this, this evening. Got a card in the mail from a group in um, Michigan that are going through our studies online, using it as a commentary and Bible study with our notes. I'm like, Lord, you're amazing. Give the truth out to people. Let them be fed. Let them grow in their relationship with the Lord. Let them come to saving faith. Speak the truth. You don't lie. Because in the end, that's not going to help them. It's going to hurt them. You know? We need to be speaking the truth. And if you don't know Jesus, man, you need to repent of your sins and come to that saving faith. Because he's the only one that can save if we really were honest about ourselves, as good as we may think we are, stop comparing yourself with people and start comparing yourself to God and see how good you are. He's holy, righteous, perfect. How do you sit? Not real well. Not at all. You need a Savior. You need Jesus. Bottom line. And that's what Jesus is doing. This is the whole point. Father, not my will, but yours be done, right? Yeah. The cross. We'll look at it next time. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your word. And Lord, as difficult as these passages are, and seeing all that you've done for us, Almighty God becoming flesh and blood and dying for our sins, just all you that in, that entailed. Lord, it's so uh, it's hard to take, realizing what our sin cost for you, Lord. But Lord, I, your love is so amazing, and we thank you for that. And we just ask, Lord, help us never to forget that, that if we stumble, fall, that we would remember you 
that we'd return to you. And Lord, that we'd help others as we go through these times, we'd be able to share with them the lessons we learned. Thank you, Father, for your love and for your forgiveness of sins through Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.